Hello, ladies, gentlemen, and non-binary. Welcome to our webinar partnered with DigiKey Electronics and presented by Texas Instruments and Worth Electronic. Now, today's webinar is Mastering Conducted Emissions partnered with DigiKey Electronics and presented by Worth Electronics' own Vidal Gonzalez, Product Definition Engineer at Worth Electronic, and Clark Kinnaird, Application Engineer at Texas Instruments. Now, if you have any questions during today's webinar, please feel free to ask them in the questions box and our presenters will answer them at the end. And if your questions don't get answered, then simply reply back to our follow-up email because you registered for today's webinar. You will automatically receive the recorded presentation and a PDF of the slides when they become available. And that email will come from webinar team at we-online.com. Uh, register for our next webinar. We are winding down the season. It's coming up November 14th. You're not going to want to miss toroidal flatwire PFC inductors versus traditional PFC inductors partnered with DigiKey Electronic. Register online at www.we-online.com slash webinars. And now I'm going to hand over the controls. Let's begin today's webinar with Texas Instruments and Worth Electronic Mastering Conducted Emissions partnered with DigiKey Electronics. Hi, Amelia. Thank you so much for your introduction. Uh, I just want to make sure this, this my screen looks right. Yep. All right. So let's get started uh, to this webinar. So uh, I would like to start with uh, a brief introduction. What are the EMC standards? Why is important EMC? And why did they exist? And how the tests are performed? So we can quickly go over, over these uh, standards and then we can uh, talk how to improve our layout and how to debug the system we're performing this kind of testing. So let's begin. Why is important EMC in our world? So EMC compliant products reduce the risk of undesired interference and disturbances. However, why is it so important? EMC is important because interferences and disturbances of electrical equipment can severely harm people, infrastructure, and the environment. For example, in 1992, a woman died because of her machine of the ambulance shut down every time the technicians turned on the radio transmitter to ask for advice. Another example is the explosion of the Texaco refinery in Milford Haven, UK, on July 1994, which was caused by an electrical storm giving rise to power surges, which strip out a number of pump models while leaving others running. The explosion led to 26 people being sustainable injured and damaged over 40 million pounds. These are just two of numerous examples and, sh and show us that taking care of EMC compliant design is not just a necessity for selling our products. It means a safer world with reliable products and satisfied customers. So, uh, let's talk about radiated emissions and immunity. So the goal for radiated emissions is to prevent disturbance of nearby electrical and electromechanical equipment. So let's begin with an example. We have a com computer. This computer has different interfaces. Uh, we have Wi-Fi, we have Bluetooth. We have different switching power supplies inside the computer that are making nodes and be are being radiated through this space. If we want to capture this noise, then we will need to have an antenna, right? However, this test cannot be measured wherever we want because in the, in the modern environment that we live, there are several other devices uh, emitting different kinds of noises in our environment. So for radio emissions are measured in an echoic chamber or semi echoic chamber, or can be done at an open area test site. Right? The, up in the mountain when there is no magnetic interferences, radio emission interferences. And for commercial and industrial products, the frequency range for, of radio emission measurements goes from 30 megahertz to 6 gigahertz for c 32, or 30 megahertz up to 40 gigahertz for FCC 47. However, the frequency range depends on, on the industry and may be as wide as from 10 kilohertz to 40 gigahertz for defense and military products. So uh, this is for emissions, but it can be done also for immunity. And the goal for, for the immunity testing is to provide functional immunity for radio frequency 
uh, electromagnetic radiation in the far field from 80 megahertz to 6 gigahertz or in the near field from 20 megahertz to 6 gigahertz. But now let's talk about conductive emissions, which is our main goal for this webinar. So conductive emissions are measured, measured at cables that are connected to the equipment under test. So in this case, we will use the same computer, but we will add now uh, the power adapter of this computer. So this power adapter is connected to our main line. However, as for the radio emissions, the main line is also like carrying a lot of noise from all the different devices connected to it. So we need to isolate our device under test. So what we do is add a listen, which is a line speed and stabilization network. We will help us isolate the noise from the, from, from, from the outlet. And also will allow us to read the noise from our device. Our best conducted emissions, the goal is to prevent connected cables from radiating and avoid the interference of connected equipment. So the, the frequency range for RF emissions measurements for commercial and industrial products goes from 150 kilohertz to 30 megahertz for six per 32. However, the frequency range depends on the industry, and also it can be wide as from 30 hertz to 40 hertz for defense and military products. For this setup, uh, we also need to define a height because uh, the device needs to be Need to, need to have a certain parasitic capacitance from all ground and walls, because in this case, we are inside a Faraday cage. The Faraday cage is surrounding or, or set or device under test. And the goal is to provide a coupling for, for the common mode of noise through these uh, walls and get back connected to the basin. Then we also have radiated magnetic field immunity. We use a clamp, a current clamp inject or an injection clamp over the cables, and we inject noise in the cables to see if our device fails, turn off, or gets rinsed completely. The goal for magnetic field immunity is functional immunity to magnetic disturbances and main power frequencies from 50 hertz to 60 hertz, or a wireless charging or inductive power transfer frequencies from 9 kilohertz and 20 megahertz. Now, let's talk about the listen, because it's, it's very important to understand how the listen works, because understanding uh, how it works, then we can start applying different methods and techniques to reduce the noise coupled to the listen. So the, uh, this is an overall of the conductor emission basic setup. And the listen consists in two low pass filters that effectively block the income noise from the source by having a high impedance input with the inline the inductor and provide a low impedance path for the capacitors, rejecting any income noise uh, coming from the green grid. On the output of the listening, any noise coming from the or device under the test will encounter the high impedance path, path through the inline inductor and will find a low impedance path through the capacitors. Now, knowing that the noise will pass through the capacitors, we can add a small resistor to measure the voltage drop across them. Then if we connect this to an EMI receiver, spectrum analyzer, or even a scope with an FFT function, we will be able to see which are the nominal frequencies or, or, of our device under test. So which kind of noises do we have uh, during, when performing conducted emissions? We have differential mode noise, and then we have common mode noise. Differential mode noise goes from one cable and comes back to the other cable. On the other hand, we have common mode noise, which noise comes in both directions through the line and neutral cable, coupled to the ground and come back to or, 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 or power supply. Let's take a look to how this noise moves with the listening connected. So differential mode noise is mainly called for high change in currents or the IDTs, and will flow from our device and your test through the capacitors and we will go through the first resistor giving us the line reference voltage. Then we will continue this path through the second resistor across the neutral capacitor now. And then let's, let's take a look to the common mode noise. So common mode noise are, is mainly driven by 
high change in, in, in voltage so or DVDTs. And this noise will go from both cables and will pass through the capacitors going into the reference, round reference, and coupling back into a device through the parasitic capacitance between your device and your test and the protective pair, which in this diagram is represented by the CSE. So if we take a closer look to the line reference voltage, we can see that the common mode noise and the differential mode noise add on the line reference point that give, and, and that give us the following formula. We have the voltage on the line reference is equal to the common mode noise plus the differential mode noise. If we take a look to the other point, to the neutral point, then we have that the common mode noise, that the voltage on the neutral line is equal to the common noise minus the differential mode noise. Then uh, knowing these formulas, then we can solve for the differential mode noise and the common mode noise. And the output will be something like this. So the differential mode noise will be equal to the voltage on the reference line, on the line reference, minus the voltage on the neutral reference over two. And for the common noise will be the line reference plus the neutral reference over two. Now, knowing this, uh, we, can, we can start talking about how we can measure the noise and how we can, we can split the noise to understand what's going on on, on our device and our test. So uh, the first uh, method that we can use is in the differential mode and common mode noise splitter. And using a small transformer and a pair of voltage dividers, we can execute the formula discussed earlier on this analog circuit. Despite this method looks like a convenient way to measure common mode noise and differential mode noise, it's not the preferred method by most EMC engineers. Because adding a transformer can add a strain inductances and capacitance that may affect the noise reading and may and make the noise reading uh, not accurate. So what EMC engineers love to use? So most, uh, most EMC engineers use the current clamp method. So by clamping over both wires, common noise will be added and will couple into the current clamp. On the other hand, the differential mode noise will, ca will cancel and, yeah, and it will not be read by the, by, the, by the current clamp. We can verify this with the right hand rule and we will see that the magnetic field will can cancel each other for the differential mode noise and the common noise will add up. Now, if we want to measure the differential mode noise, we can pass one of the cables contrary to the other, effectively canceling the common mode noise and adding the differential mode noise with the same principle as the common mode noise measurement. This, this method is the, the, the preferred by the EMC engineers because it, it, it doesn't disturb the, the, the measurement or it doesn't interfere too much with the, with the reading. So knowing that, we need to understand uh, three different concepts for, for EMC. So our, which are the, the source, the coupling pad, and the receiver. What is the source? In the real world, there are sources of unwanted electric or electromagnetic noise. For EMC immunity tests, the noise source are well-defined with the goal that these sources should be as close as possible to the real world such as AC generators, force generators, search generators, and antennas. Uh, for the coupling path, uh, the noise needs to have a, a path from the source to the victim. This path is called the coupling path or coupling channel. And then we have the victim or receiver, which is the receptor of the noise, noise which could cause interference. So let's take a look, a closer look to the coupling path. So, uh, we have conductive coupling, which is uh, mainly caused be because you have a common impedance. We have capacity coupling, which stands for the electric field coupling. We have inductive coupling, mainly because of magnetic field coupling. Uh, this inductive coupling can occur if there is any mutual inductance between two or more circuits. And the field of concern may, uh, for the inductive coupling is the magnetic. Thus, inductive coupling is a near field coupling, which means that the noise source and the victim who receive the noise are closely located to each other. And then we have uh, radiated coupling. This is mainly 
caused by unintentional antennas that we have in your PCB design. So sometimes we just lay out the board. Uh, we don't we don't think uh, on the length of this path of the paths, and these paths can lead into unintentional antennas that can receive or radiate uh, noise into an environment. So let's talk about design for, 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 for EMC. So defining an EMC concept is very, very, very important since it, uh, designing the, the EMC concept from the very beginning. Because uh, and you need to take account the grounding, defining the grounding concept of the product, the system group grounding, the subsystem of the product grounding, a shielding, define how to shield sensitive circuits and cables, filtering, define if and how cables and wires have to be filtered, especially considering ESD, EFT, and storage for cable. But leave your product RF filtering should be considered for every cable. It is very important to uh, have a concept phase of EMC uh, in your early stage of the design. Because if we wait for to the production test, this can lead us to have a 500 uh, extra cost if we, if we would like to, to change something in your board. And if we wait till the operational uh, part of our project, this can lead, lead into a thousand uh, more, more expensive changes. So having a concept phase uh, of EMC since the beginning will help us reduce the extra cost or the committed cost through the live project. Let's talk about uh, the the, the tool that we have to get rid of, uh, of, of the noise. So we have the widely known cone mode choke, as in its name says, attenuates the cone mode noise using the same principle of the current clamp, allowing the common mode noise to couple into the core and burning this energy as heat. However, uh, cone mode chokes not only help reduce the common mode noise, it also helps reduce the differential mode noise due to this straight capacitance that can be considered as an inductory series to and can introduce an insertion loss for differential mode currents. Here, we can see an example of the insert insertion loss for a common mode choke, and uh, for the common mode noise, sorry, and insertion loss for the differential mode noise. Then we have the inductor. The inductor can help us reduce the noise. We have inductors that they, they, the inductor's impedance increases over the frequency. So we will consider inductors are, or blocking uh, tools for the noise. Then we have the capacitors. Capacitors, they, their impedance decrease over the frequency. And this, uh, and the capacitors will help us bypass the noise. Here's an example of uh, using the coupling capacitors. So the impedance frequency response of capacitors has a different shape depending on the capacitance. Uh, here we have an example using three different capacitors with the values of 0 0.01 microfarad, 0.1 microfarad, and 4.7 microfarad. This uh, allows us to have a constant insertion loss across a broad frequency spectrum. In the example shown above, we can see a 12 dB attenuation using this decoupling capacitor method. It is important. It is always important to have in mind the frequency response of all of the components because when we attempt to reduce the noise, we will use the high frequency response of the components. Because when we are talking about noise, we will always think about 30 megahertz and oh, sorry, about around 150 kilohertz for conducted emissions. And then components will behave differently. Here is a summary of the high frequency response of some of the components. Uh, so as we can, as we see earlier, we have the capacitor with decreased impedance. Inductor will increase impedance over frequency. A chip uh, ferrite will have a similar behavior, increasing the impedance over frequency. Uh, cable mount ferrites will have uh, a, a behavior uh, similar to the common mode choke. And then we have the common mode choke, which also increases impedance for common mode noise over frequency, as well as differ uh, differential mode noise impedance or insertion loss. So uh, here's a summary of what, what kind of components we can use to uh, reduce the common mode noise and the differential mode noise. So for differential mode noise, 
filter, uh, the filters are X capacitors, inductors, and PCB mount ferrites. For common mode noise, we have uh, the common mode choke, uh, Y capacitors, and cable mount ferrite gates. So we did say uh, this was a brief introduction to the EMC world. I will hand in the, the control to, to Clark so he can continue with uh, the board layout improvement. So, Clark, I'm giving you the control now. Thank you. Hey, there it is. Cool. Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, Clark Kinnaird, and I'm in Dallas. So, we're excited that the Rangers won last night. So, if you're paying attention to that, if you're in Houston, uh, don't worry about that. Okay, anyway, just some more uh, discussion about how to improve and, and again, focusing on conducted emissions here. So uh, there's another whole topic related, but uh, if we think about what's going on with radiated, and of course, there's a whole flip side of the whole thing, which is it, rather than emissions, thinking about immunity. Okay, just wanted to sort of put in context, my little world uh, that I pay attention to has a lot to do with motor drives, but motor drives are similar to power supplies and a bunch of other things that have, have to do with any just about anything you might be building from an electronic standpoint. Um, in my case, I'm running off an automotive battery because my focus is on automotive stuff, but uh, as been always saying, you might be coming off of power mains, you might be operating off solar, who the heck knows? But, but in general, um, I just want to focus again and say, you know, we've got, we've got EMC concerns and why do we? Well, if everything was, uh, if nothing was switching, if everything was DC, if everything was steady state, uh, we wouldn't have to worry too much because there wouldn't be any what they call intentional uh, radiators, intentional sources. But every time you switch any current, and you might be switching it to control a motor, you might be switching it to turn a screen on and off, whatever, you've got all these opportunity points where the emissions, you know, the source of the emissions are gonna come from something. And I'll just sort of say that, you know, working from the right, which is where in my case, some high power is, and you might think about that as a power supply or a screen or whatever, it's sort of the real world stuff. And that tends to be the higher current kind of places, higher power. So that's an opportunity every time you switch something on or off and the frequency at which you do that uh, certainly depends on the application. But then you kind of work backwards towards uh, whatever your power source is. And so maybe you've got some MOSFETs that are switching and they can create noise and then you work backwards and okay, maybe I need to filter that but I also might have a, an MCU a microcontroller or some sort of you know digital stuff going on, and it's certainly switching, and typically at a very high rate, whatever the clock frequency that is. And then I may have some sort of communication, whatever that is, um, talking to the rest of the world. So we wouldn't have any EMC emissions problems if we didn't have any sources that were typically switched. I mean, if you if you build a radio, I mean, certainly it's going to generate some source. But in general, we wor we what we worry about is the the frequency content of things that are switching. Okay, so if you could get rid of all that, you'd be in good shape. So one way you can uh, mitigate at the source, and then I'll keep talking about and get into the layout things. But if you can mitigate and reduce the amount of mission power at the source. Uh, you can solve a bunch of problems there. So for example, again, and this, it could be a power supply or it could be something, uh, you know, LEDs could be just about anything, but we've got a drive stage. And when it switches on and off, um, you know, a square wave, if you go back to your EMAG theory, has uh, odd, odd harmonic contents all the way to infinity, at least uh, theoretically. And so the question is, you know, every time I turn something on, if it looks like a square wave, it's going to have this high frequency content. And so one of the things you can do is, is slow down or try to get rid of the sharp edges on that square wave when you switch. So just one way to do that is to adjust uh, in the case of, you know, where I've got MOSFETs and I've got a drive stage here. However, I'm doing it, I want to make a nice smooth waveform like this rather than a much sharper waveform like this. And you can see what's going on here. And this is looks like your, yeah, if you remember your old classical second order system, 
with all the, the bounce on it. And what I've done here is say, I'm, I'm turning on the gate drive to the, those final drive stage, and I'm turning it on really hard because I want it to switch fast, which is legit. I want to be able to do that. And that makes my power efficiency very good. But I get this ringing, and that's kind of unavoidable in any real world system with inductance, and we'll talk about the layout effects of that. But if I turn down the gate drive and say, I'm going to drive it a little less hard, I'm going to give it a little bit more time. You can notice the scale is changing here. Give it some more time to make that switch. Uh, I start to calm down those, uh, those high frequency, you know, even though I'm only switching on and off, every time I switch, I can get this bounce stuff. Uh, and so what I want to do is, is not have that. Shoot, is that showing up? Yeah, it sure is good. My password's expiring. Anyway, I want to smooth those things out. So attacking things at the source is a big deal. If you can do that, um, it's going to solve some problems for you. Um, some of our, a lot of our devices, it, it's adjustable by register setting. And you can see that, you know, here's a spectrum and we're up in the high frequency and uh, this is the FM band. So up at 108 megahertz, 100 megahertz. And we've got these limits here. This is for an automotive sort of system. But you can see if I bring down the gate drive, I can reduce these peak emissions significantly, you know, from here down to here and from here to here. So even before we get to layout, pay attention to, and, and, and it dovetails into layout because you need to know where your emissions are coming from and it's every place that anything switches. Okay, another thing we might wanna pay attention to is the grounding techniques. And uh, again, in an automotive world, I pay a lot of attention to CISPR 25, which, uh, you know, one of the specs and that all was talked about, there's a whole bunch of different ones. But there's different ways even within the spec to talk about how we're doing the grounding. So if I think about, you know, here's a module I'm going to test and here's other modules, I worry about noise from this module getting into this one. And, you know, what are switching here and it gets into here. And what do they share? They share power and they share ground. Uh, they might share things through the network and all that. But there's different ways to uh, do that grounding. So I might, from each one of these circuits, I might take and take the ground back to some central point, a star ground, a single point ground. And that's very effective for reducing the low frequency and issues we might have at low frequencies. Uh, but there's a different way to do it, to kind of depending on how, you know, what particular EMC dragon you're fighting at the time that might say, well, a better way to do it is to take, and this is what in, in automotive you might think of as the chassis ground and the same sort of thing in other applications. But if I've got a nice heavy uh, ground potential there right uh, underneath everybody, go directly to that straight down there instead of taking it all the way back here. And then there's, of course, there's a hybrid that's kind of like, well, kind of do both and I'm going to passively couple through here so there's a lot of different ways to think about doing the grounding and the spec, at least for automotive, the specification, uh, the CISPR spec talks about what they call remote ground, which says I'm going to take every one of the grounds from whatever my module might be all the way back to the power source. Or what I can do is just go bang that straight down into the chassis, which for this test setup, and it all kind of went through it. It's, it's we've got a big copper ground plane. So if I go straight down to that, I've got a, a lower impedance path back to my power source. And both of these are legitimate, but uh, kind of depends on the application, which one is more uh, real life. But you can see, and again, you know, every, every possible application is a little bit different. You can see it can have a big effect on how you do the grounding, whether you're locally grounded, meaning I've got to take that uh, straight down to the chassis, or if I've got a remote ground and have to run with through some sort of cable wire harness back to my power source. So it's a thing to pay attention to. And, you know, here's the disclaimer. There's a lot of other things to think about also. And with everything else you do with EMC, it's it's one of those things where you might fix one problem and find out that it's going to impact you, impact you negatively in a different way. So there's, there's, optimization uh, that can be done for low frequencies that may or may not be a good idea or a bad idea at high frequencies. So you really have to pay attention to, um, you know, exactly what, what are my sources, 
what is the cause of all the various things I might have. But in general, you think about ground, not just the ground path, but also the ground loops. So that if you create a ground loop, and you can see that here, you know, we've drawn it like this, but if I ground here and I ground here, and I, in addition, have uh, a grounding path through here, I've created a loop. And every loop you can think about as an antenna. So you need to think about not just, you can't necessarily overdo the grounding as far as, you know, belt and suspenders kind of concept. But you have to think about, how am I going to then receive a bunch of ground offset that comes in because I have this loop? Especially, you know, what happens if the, if I don't think about the impedance from one side to the other, which is always going to be non-zero. Anyway, so there's, there's, there's not always a, which is why it's always a subject, it's not always one particular uh, solution that'll solve, you know, everybody's problems. And if, if that were true, we'd, We'd already know the answer. So anyway, there's a bunch of different ways where you might choose between the different uh, grounding schemes uh, to try to minimize any conducted emissions that you might uh, experience. All right, now let's get back, and, and, and that's certainly some ground rules, pun intended, but uh, we might think about also um, on the board, the layout. And, and this really uh, goes to the wire harness too, but. One of the things we want to do is think about those sources that are switching and minimize the loop area for any switching node, which, uh, and this is true with power supplies, with uh, any sort of driver, anything that's turning on and off current. And if, it, if you don't have one of those, it's probably not a very interesting system. Uh, but you think about, I've got some load, and again, I, I think about motors. And I'm gonna think about my power source and you know, I might draw the circuit like this, but if I implement the circuit like this, I'm gonna run into trouble. So I think about, all right, when I turn on that particular path and there's my green and it's coming out of the battery and it's going through, the, uh, going through one of the MOSFETs and goes through my load and comes back and there's my return path. So everything looks good and it's like, great, that's fine. When I'm driving that, I certainly have a loop area, but I'd wanna think about uh, not making that loop area too big because assuming that uh, I've got current flowing and I'm switching this on and off, every time I do that, that loop area is acting like an antenna and it's gonna transmit and I'm gonna see that in uh, radiated, but I might also see that um, I think about radiating on the board from one signal to another. All right, and let's take it a little bit further and say, okay, when I turn that off, I get some recirculation path. So especially with motors, but anything with inductance, and it could be a power supply or anything else, uh, I've got a recirculation path and that keeps going. And what you notice is, okay, well, that's a different loop going on there. And what I wanna think about is what, uh, what's the same for both loops and what's different for both loops. And so if I think about the inductance through each of these and I think about what's happening with switching, I've got the path that's on, during the on duty cycle and that's in the, the green and then the blue is off and the orange is where they don't overlap. So that's where I'm gonna pick up some very high and, and look at the size of this. If I made it this way, that's a really big area where the change in current, and, and you know, if the current never changes, I don't really have a problem. But when I do switch, I've got that orange loop that is a big area if, it's, if you actually implement it this way. Um, and that's gonna be, cause a big problem, right? So it can, uh, it can radiate into other signals. It can uh, show up all over the place. Okay, so just, um, Here's, here's an actual example. The green didn't show up for some reason, but anyway, you can see here's an orange area, and that's the part I'm most worried about is when I'm switching my currents, that's a pretty darn big loop. And we take a look at this and did a better layout, and this is more or less to scale. I mean, it's, it's hard to make everything, you can't make it absolutely zero, but I can make it a lot smaller. So in this case, my DIDT loop is much smaller. So I if I just examine and I go back through any layout and say, where are the loops and how big is the area? And just think about the, each of the loops as an antenna and figure out where the current goes and where it returns, um, it, it can help you out. Uh, here's another example. So 
Here's a gate drive. This is one of our devices, again, motor centric, because that's where I live and breathe. But um, even just thinking about, okay, I'm gonna drive the gate and it returns this path. And I just think about all the, the gate drive loops and these aren't even high current. There's another whole problem out here with the motor. But if I can reduce, if I can run these traces parallel and close to each other, look how much I can reduce that, that kind of loop area. So all of that says, you know, I want to attack the source and maybe slow down the edges when I can, but I certainly I can't in every case slow down every edge the way I'd like to. So I need to reduce the antenna size as much as I possibly can. Um, here, here's the same sort of thing in a, in a definitive layout. So I want to minimize the, the loop drive and I did it. This is a, an example of, I started off with the first layer and the second layer, and you can see this is not quite optimized because all of this stuff is kind of spread out and I've got some signals going down into the bottom layer and then they're coming back up and, you know, just, I'm asking for trouble with this kind of thing. You can also see I've chopped up my, my ground layer there. So one of the things I want to do is say, okay, well, think about that loop. If possible, keep it on the same, keep it on the same layer. And look, I ran these two now parallel to each other. So the signal and the return are right next to each other, minimizing the loop area as much as possible. And yeah, I had to go down and come back up another, come back up to the top layer where my, my components are. But the loop area instead of, and again, area is in this case is a big deal, uh, even though the length is relatively still is about as long, but the area has been made pretty much effectively zero. So attack that, that loop area and that's attacking. It's basically just saying, I'm gonna make the antenna small. Think about, you know, if you've got a, any kind of antenna that you're trying to reduce, uh, just get after it. Uh, then, Again, just kind of in general, if you think about where are my switching nodes, and in this case, I'm switching, I'm thinking about my voltage rather than my current, and how am I going to minimize that node area? Well, I think about where is the switching happening? Um, every time that these MOSFETs turn on and off, that signal that could be a high current switch can radiate on the board not even radiated emissions from the board, but just on the board can radiate to other layers, other signals throughout there. Uh, so you think about that as an antenna. And so trying to think about how I'm gonna you know, switch, I'd like to switch more slowly so I don't have the high frequency harmonics, but I can also just think about trying to uh, not give it a, a path to radiate out into other parts of the board, which then couples back into signals that you didn't expect to have conducted emissions on. All right, so here's an example again. Um, these are gonna tend to look the same, but basically it is, think about here's this big area for my voltage, and that's gonna be a switching node. Here's my output connector, and it comes all the way back here. And can I instead shorten that stuff up? Can I make it smaller? Can I make it more compact? And, and I would say, kind of like I said at the beginning, you focus on the high power, high current stuff first. So kind of start at your output uh, connector and work backwards towards your little current, um, you know, lower power kind of things because the high, high power stuff is gonna give you the biggest problem. So make it more compact, make it closer together, try to get those, you know, all the fields to cancel, uh, good stuff like that. Um, stack up. Stack up uh, costs money. A two-layer board is less expensive than a four-layer board, but you can solve a lot of problems, getting back to what Vidal said. If you can nip the problems at the beginning during the concept and design phase, it's going to save you a lot of headaches when you get to the end of the, the testing and, and rework kind of stage. So, you know, a four-layer board or even more uh, is going to work out uh, to give you more options and more tools than a two-layer board. Try to keep the ground layer continuous, try to keep the uh, overall impedance of the ground path low. I mean, pretty much uh, bread and butter kind of things there. Um, here's just an example. We had, and, and I'll show you the results in just a second, but this board uh, on the left was a two layer board, on the right was a four layer board, and basically did exactly the same thing, uh, but didn't pass our uh, customer requirements uh, the first time and did pass the second time. So. 
you know, you can imagine, you can see how much rework was done there. Um, and it wasn't simple, but you, we did do a bunch of things like including Here's a uh, ground layer completely here. Here's a power layer that's almost, you know, it's as full as we could make it. It's needed to run some traces through there. And then the top and bottom, then the signals on the top were mostly power. The, the signals on the bottom were lower power, uh, like logic and, and analog stuff. And they were kept away from this top layer switching by these internal layers. And look at that nice, big, fat ground plane. Oh, it's beautiful. All right, anyway, so another thing was, we separated instead of trying to bring all the signals in and then back out on one connector, we brought the power in on one side, took it through a worth uh, common mode choke right here, went through some other filters through here, and then our output was separated. Because our output was switching, our input we wanted to keep quiet, because of course this is the side that's connected to everything else in the network. And and so, you know, making it so that we had a straight through path and the loud, noisy stuff on the right was separated from the sensitive stuff on the left uh, gave us a lot better, uh, a lot better performance. So, you know, you can see here, uh, just this is nothing but layout, same components, same performance, same uh, function and drop significantly uh, going from PCB version one to two. So. You know, this is the kind of rework you'd like to figure out at the beginning rather than at the end. So a lot of things going on there. And just to kind of tap onto that, we had the common mode choke. We have uh, also what we call a Pi filter for, for the differential, and they have different jobs. Um, and, and both of them made a big difference. So, you know, thanks to our folks at Worth, uh, that was very helpful getting their take on all this. And uh, yeah, anyway, so. Don't want to hog all the time, but you know, there's a lot of techniques, both layout and kind of what I would call the basic design before you even start thinking about the grounding and you know a million different things to work on. So I'll, I'll pass it back to Vidal. We got some uh, tips and tricks, I guess, on uh, debugging and testing. That's right. So thank you so much, uh, Carl, for, for your presentation, for your layout improvement presentation. Okay. Uh, as I was uh, mentioned earlier, well, after all of your design stage, uh, looking to have uh, differential mode filters, common mode filters, uh, good layout, and then uh, you go to the to the chamber and see and see this result, right? So most likely you will feel you will feel down and see what what I have done wrong. Uh, where should should I start again? And uh, this is this presentation is how or the steps, it's going to be about the steps of how you can debug your board. So let's begin from, uh, from the basic stuff. So when your system is failing during conducted emissions, uh, it's a good practice to start removing some of the filters from your board, if there is any, uh, to verify that our filters are actually doing the job. Uh, in this test, uh, we remove the common choke from the board and there was no ch not change in the EMI reading or EMI signature. Uh, I'm going to go quickly over, over two, two, two slides. We see some, some change, uh, mainly due to we increase the cables uh, for, the, for this test this tube. Uh, we can see an increase. Uh, oh, sorry. Now we're looking to a different light. Sorry. So no, there, there, there's almost no change between the two readings. So what, what are we going to do next is see if we have any differential mode uh, noise. So in this test, we have a twisted cables. This helps us reduce differential mode noise because as we said before, uh, differential mode noise is coming from one cable, cable and returning to the, from the other cable. So if we twist the cables, this noise will cancel each other and, and we'll get reduced. So what happened if we twist the cables? So uh, as we expected, there is an increase on the low frequency uh, range around 300 kilohertz, which we can we can say that this uh, noise is coming from differential mode noise, because the only thing that we that we have done so far is just untwisting the cables. So we need to figure out what kind of noise is dominating our system, so we can start uh, taking action, because. Otherwise, we will, we will be blindfold if we, if we don't know what kind of noise is coming from, from, from our system. 
So using the current climb method, we can see that, that in fact, there is no differential mode noise at all. In this case, we place both cables uh, close together. They are not twisted at all, but by placing ca the cables close together, there is also a differential mode attenuation, not as strong as twisting the cables. But as you can see, we don't have this, the, this spike on the 300 kilohertz, but we do have some uh, noise on that region as well. So let's take a look to the common mode noise. So what a surprise. Uh, or main source of noise is common mode noise. As, as we can see, actually, it has almost the same shape as the, as the original, uh, as the first measurement. We have also a spike on the range of uh, one to three megahertz. It is also high around uh, six megahertz and over 30 megahertz is also uh, way above the limits uh, for the peak and quasi peak. So what's going wrong here? So actually what's happening uh, uh, on this design uh, is that the common mode noise is bypassing the common mode choke. Here's a simplified version of the stack up of the board. Um, we can see here that uh, our input voltage that we have connected to the common mode choke, uh, and, it's, um, and after the common mode choke, we will have our clean voltage, or in this case, I call it voltage uh, common mode choke and ground common mode choke. These two are connected to a ground to, to a ground plane and a power a power lane with through VS, and these planes extend under the common mode choke, generating a big parasitic capacitance between the input voltage and ground uh, and, and ground plane, and or filter voltage and a filter ground plane. As you can see here, uh, let me just take my pointer. As you can see here, so this is our input voltage. Uh, and ground uh, uh, and ground coming from the battery, getting into the common choke. Then we have the filter voltage and, and ground. But then we connect this output uh, output voltage from the common choke to a plane that goes underneath the, the common choke, uh, creating this parasitic capacitance, which makes the common nodes bypass uh, through the, through the common mode choke because they found an easier path through the parasitic capacitance uh, instead of the, the common mode choke because the common mode choke will, uh, will introduce a big uh, impedance for the noise. So uh, an easy solution will be to uh, add the common mode choke uh, externally to the board to see if there is any improvement. But what we are trying to achieve is to find where the common mode noise source is in your board. So what we, what we will need is uh, copper tape, aluminum tape. Uh, we will use some uh, shielding textiles. This will help us to connect the shield isolate parts on the board or system. It we will also use the DIY shielding play. This will also allow us to uh, shape different shields to isolate certain parts of the board. And um, it is handy to have a kit of different clamp on ferrites to help us reduce the common noise uh, for the purpose of this experiment. Clamp on ferrites were not really needed. Uh, so let's talk about uh, how, how we can isolate our system. So we know that the common noise couples through the ground plane. So let's, let, let's make a, a shield to try the common noise to couple to the, to the ground plane. So right now, with the help of the DIY shielding and the copper tape, we are isolating the motor. And actually here, what's happening is the noise increase overall. What does this mean? The problem here is that we have a floating ground. This, this, this shielding is not connected to, to our ground. So what actually what we are doing is basically increasing the area for or noise to, to, to couple with the parasitic capacitance that we have with the, with the table. So we have a bigger area connected to the chassis of the motor. Uh, this bigger area will project a bigger area on the copper, on the copper ta table and will increase the capacitance, allowing more noise to flow through our system. So with this, with this test, with this experiment, we we find 
that the, the motor is actually one of the main sources. The chassis of the motor is a coupling noise into a ground plane, generating common noise going back to the listing and coming back to a board. Uh, let's do the same test for the board. Uh, so if we connect the board, uh, if we place the shield under the board, actually there is no change at all. There is a big difference on the uh, on our EMI reading uh, because the board is not uh, grounded in the experiment. If we ground it, uh, if we if we ground the board, then we will have basically the same EMI signature as we have at the beginning of the experiment. Uh, sorry here for the picture. Uh, I couldn't find the picture where we ground the board, so you you have to trust me that uh, we we connect the the grounded board to the to the shielding. So what's what what will be the next step? So the next step will be to place the shielding under uh, the cables, the board, and the motor to see what happened. Okay, uh, now we see some improvement. So by adding the shielding underneath the board, cables, and motor, and grounding the shielding to the board with the copper tape and the motor, we have a big improvement up to the 30 megahertz range. However, this is something not possible in a real application. We can just add a part of the cage to our product and sell it, right? It's just, it will be too expensive. It, it will look ugly and most likely it will not be feasible to, ma to, to have a massive production of this product. So let's try something different. What if uh, we isolate the cables? So taking advantage of the textile shielding flexibility, we grab the cables and connect one end of the shielding to the motor and the other end of the ground of the board. We can see that there is an even a bigger attenuation because now we are providing a low impedance path for the noise to flow because instead of having uh, a bigger distance from, from the cables and motor to the, to the shielding, now this distance is very, very close to the cable uh, provided, uh, reducing the parasitic capacitance and providing a low, uh, a low impedance path for this noise to flow. We managed to reduce 12 dBs at 3 megahertz, six, six, uh, uh, from 3 megahertz and 6 megahertz region. However, we still have over the limit at 30 megahertz and beyond. Uh, for this experiment, uh, we can cl conclude that the main source of the noise are the cables and the motor. Since we have a differential current flowing through the cables, uh, noise magnetic capacity to couple to the ground plane, and also the internal noise of the motor that is being generated by the commuting, commuting brushes, uh, because this is a brush uh, DC motor, create a high DVDT that couple as a common noise into the chassis, and then the chassis is coupling capacitively to the ground plane. So connecting the chassis of the motor to the ground will also provide a path with the lowest impedance, preventing the noise to couple to the ground plane of the table. So what's the next step? The next step will be adding the common choke outside the, uh, the board, because we know that uh, right now we cannot trust having the common choke inside the board because it's been a bypass through the parasitic capacitance of the underneath uh, power and ground layers. So by connecting the common choke, uh, in this case, we are using a nanocrystalline core, which has a broad bar insertion loss. There are three ma major regions of improvement. The region at 250 kilohertz, which has a differential uh, mode noise uh, that is attenuated by the strain ductance of the common choke. If you remember on this region, when I twist the cables, uh, we had an increase in the 300, 300 kilohertz uh, region. Now that uh, we, uh, if, if you see the picture of the setup, the, the, the cables are untwisted and we get a reduction on that, on that area. That's due to the strain ductance of the common choke. And from the 3 megahertz to 10 megahertz, there is a 5 dB attenuation and a 10 dB attenuation from 10 megahertz to 30 megahertz. By adding the common choke to the board, we are able to reduce even more the noise. And despite, despite the board was already compliant, uh, with only the shielding, uh, the extra common uh, choke will provide system Im immunity. So it is always to to is better to prevent and to uh, 
leave a fo footprint in your device if you if you are not certain that you will need it. So in the future, if you need to add the, the common choke, you will add it. And also this extra layer of security will provide immunity because same as the listening, you have a high imp uh, input inductance, uh, will create a high input impedance for the noise to cross. Uh, this will effectively isolate your, your board from the rest of the system and will prevent any noise to, to get into your board. So uh, what is the takeaway uh, from, from this? Uh, always design uh, with EMC in mind. It doesn't hurt to leave some empty footprints to add some decoupling capacitors, ferrites, or even shielding in, on areas where you know you, may, you might have issues. Be in control of the noise. Don't let the noise take the path it wants. You need to shape it where, 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 you, where you want to have the noise and don't let it find a better coupling path. So be aware of the coupling paths and define where the noise where you want, where you want to go, flow through. As uh, Clark was saying, defining your ground is very important. Uh, engineer often being that the ground is just a trash bin where you can throw whatever you want. Uh, you need to have a low impedance plan, uh, uh, ground plane and define the return current path for, for, for your device. You can just, just uh, drive a motor and, and connect the, 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 the ground directly to the ground plane. Uh, you need to have a return current path and then you can connect that to the, to the ground plane. Uh, also control the rise and fall time is, is very important. Look for an IC that allows you having flexibility uh, with the rise and fall time. And it's even better if you have a sp spread spectrum capabilities, they will also help you reduce the EMI on uh, overall. Oh, sorry, I moved too fast. Uh, also, uh, cable shield uh, grounding. If you have an exp any exposed cable with a differential current inside, always twist the cables to minimize a couple of differential mode noise and add a shielding to the cables and ground on both sides. It's not enough to ground on only one side. We need to ground on both sides to have a reliable shielding uh, on our cable. Uh, with this, uh, I would like to, to conclude that when you are working on, 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 on your design and you are performing uh, the conducted emissions or radiated emissions, uh, don't overthink to, uh, the, the things. Uh, start from the basic. Uh, sometimes when you see that your device is failing, you, you don't know where to start. Start by identifying your noise source. What it is, you have common mode noise, you have differential mode noise. Where is, where is this noise coming from? Uh, start just, you can use a piece of uh, a foil, metallic foil, start placing under different areas around this uh, foil. Uh, uh, obviously, because if you don't ground, you will have a floating ground and start looking how the, the noise behave. And this will give you a better uh, overlook of, of the system and, and where the noise is coupling. And when you find the coupling path, add a filter there. Hopefully, if, if you think in advance and you define your EMC concept in the beginning, you, you will not need to redesign your board and it will be an easy fix. Uh, I would like to uh, talk about the, the, the book of design for electromagnetic compatibility in a nutshell. Uh, this book uh, inspired me to, to, to be part of this project and on some of the content and most of it is uh, from this book. Uh, it is a free book that you can download. Uh, it is a collaboration from Burt Electronic and Rodin Schwarz. It's, uh, go, it goes from the beginning, this, this, the history of, uh, of, uh, com of radiated and common mode noise regulations, and it will go through all different steps. Uh, and it's very, very, very easy to digest. Uh, so now it's time for, for the Q&A. Uh, we will see your, uh, your questions in the chat. So if you have any question, just uh, feel free to to ask. Yes, thank you very much, Fidel and Clark, for presenting today's webinar. We are taking questions in the chat, and we do have a few rolling on in. Again, the chat box is a little question mark in the, well, in mine, it's in the upper right-hand corner. Simply click on that to ask a question. 
Our first question here, do these techniques for conducted emissions also work for radiated emissions? Uh, I can take that one. Well, we've kind of alluded to it a little bit uh, throughout the presentation. Um, okay, so focus of this was on conducted, which means we're going back down uh, power lines or, you know, somehow along the conductors. A lot of the same techniques, uh, certainly if you could, um, if you could reduce all the sources and reduce the frequencies that they do apply to radiated uh, emissions. I typically kind of think of conducted emissions as being the easier of the two uh, in that, uh, you know, at least you know, you, it is easier to maybe identify the, the paths through which the emissions are being uh, transported. When you get to radiated, it becomes more of a, a lot more geometry and whether you're near, near field or far field, and that's where you're uh, common mode versus differential, you know, and then you really uh, get into all kinds of weird things there, which has to do with how your antennas are oriented and things like that. Uh, in general, I typically say you want to attack the conducted emissions first. Once you've solved those problems, hopefully you will have impacted in a good way the radiated emissions. Uh, it's it's not a real pat answer, but yes, uh, would be the the short answer to, do these techniques help? Thank you, Clark, for answering that one. Uh, moving on to our second question here. Is it possible to do preliminary testing without the chamber and the receiver? Uh, I'll take over that question. Uh, actually, yes. Uh, most of the people think like uh, to perform conducted emissions is uh, you need a, a well, Reality for conducting emissions, you need a chamber, you need an expensive receiver. Uh, you can actually do it with a clamp on for a, with a clamp on uh, a current clamp, sorry. Uh, you can have a spectrum analyzer, a scope with a F50 function. You, and I mean, it will not be ideally because you still need a listen. If you have a listen, it will, it will be even better. But at least you, could, you can have an idea of how the noise is moving around uh, the system. And that will help you. So when you go to the chamber and test your board, uh, you will have a better outlook of your of your board, and you will know which areas are uh, likely to fail. And hopefully, when you are at the EMC chamber, uh, you will find a solution faster. Thank you, Fidel. Our third question here: Do slower slew rates cause thermal problems because they have higher power dissipation? Oh, yeah, that uh, it depends, which is always the answer everybody gives. Um, if you slow down your slew rate, in other words, you take a longer time, you try to smooth out that switching, yes, because you spend more time with your power uh, drive stage. It's spending more time, you know, not 100% off or not 100% on. So it's going through that transition zone. It will increase the uh, It'll increase the amount of power dissipation in the drive stage. Uh, what you're typically, though, do is if you look back at, and you'll see the slides when we send them out, but if you look at how long we were taking, uh, it, it was moving from something like uh, 20 micros, and it must have been nanoseconds, 20 nanoseconds up to 500 nanoseconds or something. So, again, depending on how, uh, how often you're switching, uh, and typically with motors, and things, power supplies, you're, you're switching, you know, below perhaps a megahertz. So hopefully that is not a big impact on your uh, power dissipation. But yes, it does increase the power dissipation to slow down the slew rate because you're spending more time uh, in the uh, in the linear range of the, of the drive stage. But yeah, anyway, you have to do the calculations. Hopefully you're only switching a low percentage of the time, and then you can spend the rest of the time letting that power uh, kind of die off. Absolutely, thank you, Clark. Um, going through our questions here because we are running a little short on time. Our next question, is local GND the same as chassis ground? Oh, that sounds like me. Uh, more or less, yes. Uh, we showed some slides there and, and, and some of the terminology, you know, uh, 
depending on exactly which specification you're reading. So local ground and remote ground are from the uh, automotive CISPR specification. Um, and there's other terms that sort of mean the same thing, but yes, um, remote ground basically means you're you're running in a star configuration back to some central point that's as all my grounds are, are are tied together only at this point versus uh, local ground says I'm going to find the nearest uh, nearest way to get a ground wire or you know some connection to a chassis or 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 somehow get to that point and I'm going to then take advantage of the the big uh, low impedance path that I've got back to the power source. So it's again like you know in, in your household you've got some sort of uh, universal ground that is the actual you know earth. Uh, in a car it might be the chassis, in an industrial system it might be the framework of, of whatever you're inside. So I think the answer to that is also yes. Thank you very much. Uh, our next question here, will adding only the common mode choke outside solve the issue? Okay, I think that's a, a question for me. Uh, actually, yes, uh, when we, we, we don't have a slide for that, but it actually improved a lot having the, the common choke outside uh, because basically it was being bypassed by the proxy capacitance between the, the layers. Uh, however, uh, when we were performing this test, we were looking for an alternative uh, for the for for the common choke. We were looking for uh, for reduce the common noise before using the common choke. Uh, that's uh, that that's what happened when we when we were testing, and and yes, you can you, you can use the common choke. However, having the shielding on your on your cables will uh, prevent to radiate to somewhere else. In the real in, in the real world, you don't know like where these cables are going to be located. Uh, the the parasitic capacitance can be, can can be even uh, larger if they are closer to to the to the ground, to the ground plane. And uh, you don't want that noise coupling to 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 you to the earth. So it's better to shield the cables, and you will be safe uh, by doing that. Uh, Vidal, we have another question here in regards to your testing. Why does the test show failure above 40 megahertz? All right. Uh, I was expecting that, that question to be asked. And uh, let me show you uh, really, really fast uh, this slide. Uh, the reason why it's showing failure is because uh, we have a noise uh, a noise floor. So this is a, a, a snapshot of the noise floor. As you can see, the average peak and quasi peak of the noise floor is quite high. Uh, so you, you can see for the quasi peak is almost, for the peak is almost 20 dBs noise floor, quasi peak is around 50 dBs, uh, average is 10 dBs. Uh, we couldn't figure out where this noise was coming from. Uh, we sub subtract the noise uh, at this frequency range uh, from our readings to determine whether it was uh, uh, passing or not. So that's, that's, that's why we assume it was passing. Thank you, Vidal. Uh, our next question is for Clark. What is the purpose of multiple value capacitor? Are those MLCC? Uh, the, the idea of having different capacitors. So uh, in when you learn about capacitors in school, they're always ideal, and they're uh, the roll off, uh, the, the impedance of the capacitor gets lower and lower as the frequency goes up. But in real life, IRL, what we find out is that um, at some point the capacitors no longer have that ideal uh, specification, and so they start to uh, they really the performance of them as a low impedance path to ground uh, goes away. And what you find out then is for low uh, frequencies, a large capacitor, a large capacitor value has a uh, good performance um, and, and therefore, you know, it, it attacks that low frequency stuff, but it tends to then not have that same kind of uh, performance at high frequencies. So actually a smaller value, which you would think wouldn't do as much, uh, does help uh, um, or a lot of cases, it will help in that it has a, a further 
it goes up higher in frequency. And so it takes care of some of the high frequency stuff, even though it's a smaller value, which would think, you know, if I've got a hundred nanofarads and right next to it, I have a 10 nanofarads. We found that you can see the difference of, you know, seeing a, a 100 and a 10 and a one right next to each other because they do have different frequency um, characteristics. So that's that's why we tend to put them, um, if you look back at the slides, um, you see this a lot. Um, there is some debate on how effective it is versus, um, you know, just using a different kind of capacitor. And that's another whole discussion too, when you get into electrolytics versus, you know, polymers and, and, and things. Uh, so to be honest, uh, it could be a whole hour on the types of capacitors and trying to pick the right ones. But I think we'll leave that for a capacitor discussion. For which there are plenty of those. Uh, we're yeah. gonna wrap yeah. <laughs> we're gonna wrap things up with our final question of today's Worth Electronic and Texas Instruments webinar. Again, if your question does not get answered, you can ask them anyway or reply directly back to our follow-up email from webinar team at we-online.com. Final question of the day. So the noise in this example was the motor noise or PWM noise in the H bridge. Um, I think that's for me because I, I remember saying motor over and over again. Uh, yeah. I think the application we were looking at, I'm, I typically have to switch my motors at 20 kilohertz, which we do because nobody can hear 20 kilohertz and too bad for dogs, but audibly you don't hear the 20 kilohertz. So that's how fast I'm gonna pulse width modulate things. And the noise is then uh, comes from two places. One is the switching and the fact that it rings on the edges. And the second is even if it was a perfect square wave without any ringing, the harmonics of the 20 kilohertz show up at 60 and you know every harmonic at 20 kilohertz. So I think the answer to the question was again, yes, it was pulse width modulation uh, and as being the source of all the, uh, the high frequency harmonics that I was worried about. Although the ringing is sort of a different, slightly different thing. It has to do with the inductance and the, you know exactly what your, your channel looks like. But yeah, mostly I'm going to start with my paying attention to my high current 20 kilohertz uh, current switching. Excellent. Thank you very much, Clark. And Vidal, thank you both for presenting today's webinar. Thank you, everybody, for joining us for today's presentation. If you have any more questions, simply reply to our follow-up email, or if you need to go into detail, just reply back to webinar team at we-online.com. I'm Amelia Thompson. You can follow Worth Electronics or myself on LinkedIn to learn more about some upcoming webinars and events. And don't forget to listen to the Worth Electronic WhatsApp podcast, where each week we are bringing application notes, blogs, press releases, webinars, and everything else to an audio and video format. New episodes launch Thursdays at 6 p.m. Central. That is the What's Up podcast. You can find it on all podcast streaming networks, including Spotify, iTunes, Google Podcasts, and so much more. Don't forget to register for our next webinar. It is toroidal flat wire PFC inductors versus traditional PFC inductors. And that's partnered with DigiKey Electronics coming up November 14th. Register online at www.we-online.com slash webinars. I'm Amelia Thompson, and I hope to see you soon.